Welcome back for another video. Today's video will be about perhaps the most infamous serial killer in Los Angeles, if not the entire state of California alone. Timothy Joseph McGee, aka Wero, was born on April 27, 1973. Timothy is both Mexican and Scottish. Growing up around gangs would eventually bring in Timothy into the gang life. The gang Timothy would be affiliated with is the Tunerville 13 gang. Tunerville was founded in the 1940s, located in Northeast Los Angeles. They are founded in Atwater Village, which is a Los Angeles community that lies between the Los Angeles River to the west and the city of Glendale to the north and east. Tunerville beefs with other gangs such as the Avenues, the Rascals, as well as Frogtown. Timothy did not have a father figure in his life as his father abandoned him as a young boy, leaving the family and moving to Alaska for work. People who knew Timothy described him as an average teen who liked to skate in the neighborhood. That would all soon to play out different, being involved in the Tunerville gang. Timothy was not your regular Serrano gang member. At age 16, Timothy would find himself on the journey to becoming the worst of the worst, from something not major as shooting someone with a BB gun, and find himself institutionalized at only 16. Timothy would then be sent to a juvenile detention facility. At the time, Timothy had a pregnant girlfriend who would visit him. Timothy was waiting to be transferred. As Timothy was waiting for transfer, he would go on and go to great lengths to do something to postpone or delay his transfer, like attack a correctional officer. Although he did not succeed, he told staff that he would stab the guards next time. He earned his first prison stay in 1994 at age 18 for assaulting a police officer in San Bernardino County. He received a four-year prison sentence for the assault and served three years of his sentence before being released in 1997. Later that year, McGee was sent back to prison on a parole violation. It was not released again until March 1999. True to form, McGee was again returned to prison for a parole violation in February 2000, serving two months before being released. What was crazy was, by the summer of 2000, at only 26, McGee had already spent a quarter of his life in prison. But police suspected that in what little time he spent outside of the California Department of Corrections, his crimes were not merely limited parole violations. When things got more serious, started after police believed that during McGee's few months as a free man in 1997, he murdered a member of the rival Rassels gang, Ryan Martin, who was reportedly shot more than 25 times. In October 1999, McGee again became the focus of a murder investigation. This time, being linked to the murder of Dwayne Dupree, a bodyguard for rap artist Ricardo Corrupt Brown. According to police reports, Dupree and others were gathered outside Echo Sound's music studio after a recording session when two gunmen approached and opened fire, killing Dupree and wounding two others. Although Dupree's murder was originally thought to be the result of a dispute between rap artists, Information eventually led detectives to suspect McGee. The killing spree would not stop. The murders and violent crimes for which he was suspected began adding up at a horrifying rate. By 2000, McGee, by then considered to be the leader of the Tunerville 13 gang. What made Timothy different as a leader was he operated Tunerville as if they were the military. He would have the gang do workouts to strengthen and condition the gang, as well as do shooting range practice to improve shooting accuracy. Timothy would take fellow gang members hunting in rival gang neighborhoods. In June 2000, only a few months out of prison, McGee again took his fellow Tunerville gangsters hunting in rival territory, finding 16-year-old Ryan Gonzalez coming home from a party. Gonzalez, a member of the Rascals gang, had no connection with McGee other than the common nickname, Wero. McGee reportedly told others he had killed Gonzalez because the area wasn't big enough for two people with the same nickname. September later that year, a 17-year-old high school student who was drawing a picture at the Los Angeles River by the name of Marty Gregory Roybal, a homeless man nearby witnessed Roybal's murder. He too became victim of Timothy McGee and was killed as well. McGee allegedly turned to his fellow Tunerville member while standing over Martin's body and commented without emotion that he was hungry and wanted to go get something to eat. Timothy was way ahead in the gang life as far as wisdom. For instance, Timothy would introduce Tunerville to tactical training and insisted that armed sentries be posted along the main thoroughfares in his territory with cell phones or radios to alert them of any suspicious activity. In the summer and fall of 2001, McGee allegedly took part in the killings of several people, 
including a man from Pomona who reportedly supported himself by robbing drug dealers, a laborer who McGee deemed an unwanted stranger, a woman he accused of reporting his family members to the police for drug dealing, and a mother of two who happened to be the first person he saw in rival territory. Timothy also planned and executed the military-style ambush of two LAPD officers on July 4, 2000 during the early morning hours. Officers Thomas Baker and Carlos Lang Garcia were lured into an area where Tunerville members were waiting to open fire. They were on patrol in northeast area when a radio call was broadcast of a robbery involving three males who fled in a gray colored vehicle. While en route to the call, Officer Baker and his partner observed a gray vehicle that matched the description of the robbery vehicle. They drove past them in the opposite direction. Officer Baker made a U-turn and began to follow the suspect's vehicle. The officers initiated a pursuit when the driver of the vehicle refused to stop and began to accelerate. Officer Baker and his partner were aware that the suspects were approaching Tumorville Gang territory, an area where there had been ambushes on northeast area patrol officers. While in pursuit, Officer Baker and his partner observed that the street was partially blocked by a washing machine. As Officer Baker negotiated a right-hand turn, an unknown suspect pushed the bicycle into the path of the police vehicle. As Officer Baker completed the turn, several unknown suspects fired upon the black and white police vehicle, striking the driver's door. Undeterred by this pre-planned ambush, both officers continued the pursuit as they received gunfire from the rear. Additionally, the suspects in the gray vehicle began to fire at the officers. In an attempt to escape the unrelenting gunfire, Officer Baker rammed the back of the suspect's vehicle, causing it to stop. The suspects in the front passenger seat exited the vehicle and pointed a semi-automatic pistol at both officers as he ran down the street. Officer Baker rammed the suspect's vehicle again, pushing it into a fence. Officer Baker observed a suspect in the rear seat with an Uzi-style assault weapon. Fearing that they both would again be assaulted by gunfire, Officer Baker and his partner fired at the suspects as they ran to a position of cover behind a nearby tree, with one suspect in the driver's seat and a second armed suspect crouched in the rear seat. Officer Baker and his partner engaged the suspects once again with their service weapons. Realizing the level of danger and threat to their lives, Officer Baker and his partner continued to communicate with each other and reloaded their duty weapons. Officer Baker calmly requested backup and additional units soon arrived and took all three suspects and their weapons into custody. Incredibly, Officer Baker and his partner were not injured during the ambush, although their police vehicle was damaged by gunfire. Joseph Little Respect, Agazade, Mario Little Boy Alman, and Ramon Chubbs Maldonado were found guilty of attempted murder to officers Tom Baker and Carlos Lynn Garcia. They were also convicted of robbing a passerby of his wallet. All three men were sentenced to two consecutive life sentences plus dozens of additional years for related offense. In 2001, beginning in June, McGee was suspected of shooting nine individuals in five months, leaving six dead and three wounded. The homicidal spree began on June 11, 2001, when McGee was allegedly traveling through the affluent Los Feliz area that borders Atwater Village and featured the popular Griffith Observatory. Manuel Apodaca Jr. lived 35 miles east of Pomona and was passing through with his pregnant girlfriend, Nina Guerrero, McGee allegedly opened fire on the vehicle on Los Feliz Boulevard near Interstate 5, known in that area as the Golden State Freeway. Apodaca, allegedly a member of the Rassels gang, was killed, and Guerrero suffered severe brain damage in July 2001. Carlos Velasquez was working at a furniture warehouse. 38-year-old Brian, 46-year-old Cherry, and her mother, 64-year-old Mary Wisoski, were fatally shot when Rodriguez McGee opened fire on their car. Because Cherry had told police about drug deals in McGee's house, Timothy was placed as a suspect in that murder. Timothy and another Tunerville member, Eduardo Limpy Rodriguez, were looking to get revenge after one of their homies was killed. They came upon a rival gang member, Duane Natividad, in the 3100 block of Hollydale Drive, six blocks south of Gonzalez's murder in 2000. Natividad was driving his Mitsubishi Montero with his girlfriend, Marjorie Mendoza, and her friend, Erica Ree. At 12.01 a.m. on November 9th, as Natividad pulled up to a residence, McGee and Rodriguez allegedly pulled in front of them, exited their vehicle, and opened fire on the Montero without warning or any verbal altercation. Natividad ducked and was struck in the right hand. 
while Reed ducked in the back seat, avoiding injury. As her boyfriend threw the car in reverse and accelerated away, Mendoza was hit multiple times and was driven to Glendale Memorial Hospital, where she later died. Eduardo would not be captured until 12 years later after he posted a Facebook picture and was recognized by police. He was apprehended at his Riverside, California home. Rodriguez, who has a tattoo of an eagle holding a snake, was arrested in November 2001 on the suspicion of the murder of a woman, Marjorie Mendoza. That year, after he and McGee shot her and her boyfriend, who was a rival gang member, Christina Duran, a friend of McGee's, learned of Marjorie Mendoza's murder after McGee solicited her help that same day. He needed to retrieve his girlfriend's cell phone he had dropped at the scene of the Mendoza murder. Duran was unsuccessful in finding the cell phone, but police managed to locate it and use it as evidence in McGee's eventual trial. Shortly after the murder, Duran admitted to police during a videotaped interview with LAPD homicide detectives that McGee was involved in the death of Mendoza. She was visibly shaken during the interrogation, frequently stating her fear of retribution. Two days after speaking with police, Christina Duran was killed in execution-style murder on the night she celebrated her 29th birthday party, allegedly shot by McGee five times on the right side of the head. McGee wrote hip-hop lyrics as a hobby but never seriously pursued music. Many of his lyrics referred to his love of killing and his hatred for the police. His writing detailed the Mendoza murder as well as other murders. One line eventually used against him in court read, Witness protection won't work. Realize your rat ain't going to make it to the stand. Referring to his goal to eliminate anyone who might testify against him, he took the time to write, Everything in this book is a work of fiction, inside a sprawling notebook in case police ever seized it. This did not deter the prosecution in his eventual trial. Before he could be arrested, Timothy McGee went to hiding and eventually fled California. During the manhunt, McGee and the Tunerville 13 gang gained national attention. The United States Marshal Service declared McGee as one of the 15 most wanted fugitives in the country. LAPD compared McGee to Charles Manson, even though Charles Manson had seven killings, opposed to McGee, who had 12 or plus more killings. McGee and Tunerville were featured in an episode of America's Most Wanted, which reenacted several of his crimes, as well as Tunerville's military-like exercise sessions. Rewards were offered for McGee as well, at least $50,000 for information leading to an arrest of the man dubbed by the media as the monster of Atwater Village. In February 2003, McGee was captured in Bullhead City, Arizona during a joint operation with BCPD, LAPD, and federal law enforcement. While awaiting trial for several murders, McGee was held without bail in the Los Angeles County Men's Central Jail for having the reputation he had McGee got the respect of other criminals, housed in cell block 3300 A-Row. McGee was the shot caller and fellow inmates would not act without his permission. On January 7, 2005, at around 4.40 p.m., inmate Rodolfo Gonzalez was intoxicated from a homemade alcoholic concoction and was to be removed from cell block A. Sheriff Deputy Raul Ibarra handcuffed Gonzalez and extracted him from a cell under the ruse of meeting with his attorney. Obediently, Gonzalez attempted to return to his cell, fearing something was amiss, as he did not have an attorney. Upon changing direction, Gonzalez was tackled by four deputies. They passed McGee's cell, who stated that Gonzalez, an acquaintance of his since elementary school, did not have his permission to leave. This angered McGee's rage and commanded inmates to assault the deputies with apples, oranges, urine, and bleach. It took 20 minutes to remove Gonzalez from the cell block successfully. McGee then ordered inmates to break the sinks in their cells so jag pieces of porcelain could be used as weapons. It was hours later, near 10 p.m. that evening when two deputies began their shifts investigating the damage in a Road. They were assaulted with books, fruit, porcelain, and various items as they entered. Inmates set multiple fires and a riot squad was assembled to squash the rebellion. By 2 a.m. the following morning, all inmates had been removed from a Road most voluntarily surrendering, but McGee dragged out by force. Addressing the fact that an officer he saw to survive the attack, McGee was quoted saying, next time I'll have to stab him. On September 27, 2007, four and a half years later after his capture, McGee went on trial for the murders of Ronnie Martin, Ryan Gonzalez, and Marjorie Mendoza. Additionally, he was charged with the attempted murders of six individuals, including LAPD officers Thomas Baker, and Carlos Lane Garcia, Duane Natividad, Erica Ree, Pedro Sanchez, and Juan Cardiel. Prosecutors initially charged the gang member 
with nine murders, but dropped six charges before the trial began, citing unreliable witnesses. McGee was described as unlike most gang members who kill for revenge. McGee seemed to kill for sport, much like a serial killer. The prosecution was able to solicit the testimony of McGee's gang rivals, former gang affiliates, and even his accomplices. Several of these witnesses were under police protection for their safety, while others had to be ordered to testify. However, intimidated by the mere presence of McGee in court, a number of rival gang members drastically changed their testimonies. Cardiel and Sanchez now claim they weren't sure who shot them a decade earlier. McGee's incriminating hip-hop lyrics were also used against him in court in which he detailed a number of his murders. He compared himself to fictional serial killer Freddy Krueger from the motion picture series A Nightmare on Elm Street and outlaw Jesse James. Residents of Atwater Village were terrified of the possibility that McGee could be found innocent and subsequently released to terrorize the neighborhood again. Police had noted that crime escalated in the area during spans when McGee was not in custody. On October 25th, 2007, after weeks of deliberations, eight men and four women found McGee guilty of all three murders. He was also found guilty in the attempted murders of four other individuals, including the two LAPD officers whose ambush he organized, and Duane Natividad and Nair Curry, who were shot at Water Village. McGee was acquitted of the attempted murders of Pedro Sanchez and Juan Cardio, both of whom identified McGee the night they were shot, only to claim in court that they could not recall the perpetrator. On November 9, 2007, after days of deliberating, the same jury that convicted McGee deadlocked on whether he should be executed or receive life without parole. After three days of deliberations, the vote remained 10 to 2 in favor of the death penalty, so prosecutors elected to retry the penalty phase of the case. On November 14, 2007, McGee stood trial for his role in the 2005 prison riot. He was sentenced to 75 years to life after being found guilty of conspiracy to commit an assault. Conspiracy to commit vandalism, three counts of resisting executive officers in the performance of their duties, and two counts of assault. On August 27, 2008, with six sheriffs standing guard and the accused sitting shackled in an orange jumpsuit, a second jury agreed unanimously that 35-year-old McGee should be sentenced to death. A fatal shooting on October 8, 2008, in which a Toonerville gang member killed a Mongols motorcycle gang member on a Los Angeles interstate, initiated a probe into gang activity in the prosecution of 20 Toonerville members. On January 9, 2009, a judge sentenced McGee to death. McGee was additionally sentenced to multiple consecutive life sentences for the four attempted murders. On August 30th, 2012, McGee slashed and stabbed the guards with the improvised weapon, a shank. The guards suffered injuries to their head, neck, and arms. Years later, the death penalty sentence law changed. McGee had been transferred from San Quentin death row to general population in Salinas Valley State Prison.